Why did I call this channel Lazy Devs? In order to understand, you have to first go through this very important test that I think every game developer should do. Let's do the 30 circle test. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Christian from Lazy Devs. Welcome. Uh, today we are going to do another like theoretical part and we're going to do a um, uh, 30 circle test uh, and it's a test that I really like to do with my students um, at the beginning of their their career uh, it's a test I really like to do as a preparation for game jam it's really great as a preparation for a game jam um, but I think it's also ge like generally like, a good test that I think every game developer should do it gives like this insight into this like most one of the most important challenges that we have as a game developer uh, it just like nails a certain problem that I think everybody is struggling with when making games. And um, so yeah, let's do the test and then let's discuss what this means for us. Now, one thing, if you want to do this test, I want you, I need you to commit. Uh, don't just like, you know, watch the video and then scroll through and then be like, okay, uh, I, I'm gonna first see what this test is all about and then later I'm gonna do the test when, when I like it. Uh, this is absolutely a test that is used up, that's kind of like a, uh, spoiled and uh, if so if you know how this plays out it's it won't be as effective anymore uh, it kind of won't work anymore and equally if you know this test or if you have done it already I don't want you to be in a comment section and, and, and spoiling it to other people uh, just like let people have their experience I think this is very impo important and valuable and in fact if you are about to do this test I don't want you to actually even look at the comment section just let's just go for it okay now disclaimer this is not a test I came up with I'm not that smart <laughs> I saw it first on, uh, there's a StarCraft 2 streamer, a very famous one called Day9, and he did it on, a, on his 40th stream about StarCraft strategy. So it's actually, he did it, he, he makes games, but he um, didn't do it as a game design test. And I was like, ah. Oh. And Day9 got it from his professor, who's a mathematics professor called Mark Bolas. But I think the original person who came up with this test is called uh, Bob McKim. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell because there's a lot of variations on this test and everybody does this test slightly differently. So like, don't worry about it, it's fine. Uh, it's a very short test. The actual test just takes two minutes. There's some prep work uh, before that. And then afterwards we're gonna spend the rest of our time uh, discussing the results because I think there's like <laughs> lots of interesting things to talk about. Uh, so let's get the prep work out of the way. Uh, so you will need just two things. You will need a, a paper, something to write on. This is an A4 sheet of paper, a Chinese one. And this, and then you need a pen as well, right? Uh, it should be A4, it should be really big. Uh, or like, <laughs> it should be normal size. <laughs> That's normal size. Um, and you need at least one sheet of paper. You can get away with one sheet of paper, but I think I, an ideal is two. Uh, and of course, so you also need a, like a surface so you can you can draw on because we're gonna draw on this paper. Now, if you need some time to collect the stuff, just pause the video now and get the sheet of paper and so forth and you know, resume the video when you have everything in front of you. Finished? All right, okay, so we're gonna do the prep work now. So what are we gonna do is I need you to fill in a sheet of paper with 30 circles uh, like this, like completely fill as much, use as much space as possible for 30 big circles. Um, I, what I did here is six columns and five rows, so that's 30 circles. Um, make sure they're as big pos as possible. Uh, there's like not too much space in between them because we are actually putting something inside the circles. That's what what's important here. Um, they don't have to be like geometrically perfect. Don't worry about it. And if there's you get, you get some of them overlap a little bit, that's fine. They can be all crooked. It's fine. It's just like you need 30 big circles uh, up in here. Okay. And actually when you're done filling an entire sheet of this, you need a second sheet. You need two sheets like this, two sheets like this. And again, if you have one sheet of paper, you can just do it on the back side. It's fine. Uh, but yeah, two sheets um, of, of 30 circles, two sets of 30 circles. So start with this now. I want to start doing this right away. And then while you're drawing the circles, I'm going to explain you some more stuff because it's a boring task. <laughs> and then there's another another step to, to this entire sequence. Okay, so now I'm going to do boop. Okay, so <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, I have to use paint here. <laughs> I don't have any pen or anything. So in a second, 
uh, after when the test uh, has begun, it hasn't begun yet, but when it has begun, I'm going to ask you to fill in those circles. And so you might be asking yourself, what does filling in circles mean? And um, so yeah, I'm going to like do it in front of you so you, you know what we're talking about. So like, I'm going to try to fill in the circle. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a pizza, right? I'm going to, I'm going to turn the circle into an object. That's how I'm going to fill the circle. I'm going to do a little drawing inside the circle to, oops, uh, well, there's no undo when you're drawing on a paper, so that's, I'm not going to undo this, although clearly this is like a madman would, would cut a pizza, right? And then I'm going to, I think every pizza slice needs a salami piece. I think if you cut a pizza in a way that the salami doesn't, like there is going to be a pizza slice without the salami, I think you're doing it wrong and you belong in pizza jail. And then, you know, maybe there's going to be some seasoning. I had pizza yesterday. We have to make our own pizza here in, in China because the Chinese people don't know how to pizza. Okay, so this is the first circle filled. Uh, what else? Um, well, maybe I can do a, a like a tennis ball, right? And I'm going to I'm going to be sure of my drawing skills by being like all 3D, right? Like this is a tennis ball and then I'm going to add some hair. Yeah, because a tennis ball is head. Tennis balls are kind of creepy, if you think about it. All right, so uh, actually I'm gonna, uh, because tennis ball is like, it's, it's like a band like this, okay? So this is a uh, second circle filled. And then I'm gonna fill in the third circle. What am I gonna do? Uh, let's, oh, we, we, you can think of outside the box, man. I'm gonna turn it into Saturn. <laughs> Look at me, I'm all creative. It's a creative exercise, right? So I'm gonna get all creative about this. I'm gonna add some bands. Well, actually it's not Saturn, it's more Jupiter, right? Because I have added the big spot. Maybe it's an alien exoplanet, you know? It's, it's something, something else, okay? Three circles filled. Like that. Okay, so if at this point, you still don't have two sets of 30 circles, you don't have two sets of these, and then I want you to actually now pause the video and concentrate on, on drawing the circles. And, uh, and I want you to be back when you have two sets of 30 circles, okay? All right, good. So now we are finally ready to start this test. Here are the rules of the test. You need to fill each circle with a drawing. Second, each circle must be different. You cannot just put the same thing into each circle. Um, you have only 60 seconds and I want you to draw as many circles as possible in this time. The more, the better, right? It's a quantity thing. Um, absolutely no cheating. Um, the moment the time runs out, I need you to drop the pen right there. You're not allowed to finish, you know, the drawing that you were working on when the timer stopped. Like it's, it's whatever you have there, you, you, you leave it at that, right? It's not really a complicated test. We're just like filling in those circles. Again, 60 seconds time. So I want you to get ready. I want you to put the paper in front of you, you know, I want to take your pen. All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. Uh, this is going to be the part where I'm actually doing a timer for you. So you, can, uh, you should be drawing your circles now. That's, that's, that's what's the goal of the test. And I'm going to sit back and sip my coffee. Mm. I'm going to actually help you out things that you can draw on the circle. I think like a lot of food stuff is good. Maybe a cookie, cookie would be good. Uh, we are at, at the 30 seconds at this point. So we are halfway, your, your, your time is halfway up. Oh, and I think you could draw a bubble, my baby girl. She loves bubbles. And we're approaching 40 seconds now. Uh, you could do like an apple or an orange. I think these are very round. Or like a watermelon. 10 seconds left. And we're almost there. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Stop. Stop whatever you are doing. It's done. It's done, this. The test is over. Now I want you to stop and see how many circles you did. How many circles did you fill out? I just want, to, I want you just to count them. How many have something in there? All right. So what usually happens is when I do this test with my students is like usually they end up with, with numbers around the 10 circles mark, right? There's a huge variation, but usually 10 circles is kind of like a median, I guess. Uh, some people did 15, some people hit 20. 
Uh, some manage only three or four, and you know that's fine. It's only you know it's it's just sixty seconds, right? I did around ten myself when I did my my, my first try. And so the question here now is why? Why did we do only so few circles? There's 30 circles there and the more the better, I said, right? And you, you, we are all perfectly capable of filling all 30 circles in 60 seconds. Why didn't we do it? Here, let me show you. All right, so I have a blank sheet of paper. I'm gonna start filling circles. One, two, three, four, five, right? Done, five circles done. Or um, let me do something else, maybe A, B, C, D, E, that's also a solution. Or maybe something like, you know, a, a dot, two dots, that's gonna be a dice dots, you know, a three dots. It's astonishingly different, like five dots. I'm gonna, I skip the four, I'm gonna do a four dots, you know, like this. There's just so many ways we can fill in those circles in a time efficient way, and we just didn't do it. We decided to to spend our time, you know, take take as we time filling in those circles, and we failed filling in all thirty circles. We ended up somewhere, you know, around ten, while it was perfectly possible to fill in thirty. Now that's a bit cheating, but I actually want you to experience this, right? I want you to go through this test again, and we're going to discuss what it means again. I know it it feels like cheating, right? Uh, I want you to get the second sheet of paper that you have and go through this test again. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go through this entire test again. I'm gonna give you a full 30, uh, 60 seconds, and this time I want you to actually try to actively try to hit 30 circles using a strategy like this. It, it makes sense. Like there's a reason for why I'm doing this. So just indulge me for a second. We're gonna do this test again, and then we're gonna just discuss the results. Okay. So get your pen ready. Three, two, one, go. So this is, test is really weird because if you know what you're doing, it's really simple. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you're just like going by your guts, it seems impossible. I say like, you you can fill in 30 circles and people are like, what? I've been drawing as fast as I can and I only managed five. How is 30 possible? You're What you're asking is the impossible, you know, like, like in Star Wars. Uh, so yeah, 25 seconds are over already. And now we are at the halfway point. And actually what happens is the second time around is a lot of people get finished early. So if you're already finished early, something you can do is you can go back and touch up some existing circles. You can you know, make them more pretty. It's fine. Uh, so 15 seconds to go. Uh, 10 seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. All right. Okay, so in the second attempt, usually most of my students will hit 30 circles, right? Um, if you some if some of them still not manage 30, 30 circles, but it's fine, they de definitely get a lot more than they did on their first try. Some people are so appalled at, at how how cheap this test is, you know, that they um, they like dig in their heels and actually deliberately do even less circles. And that's fine too, you know, it's fine to be mad at me. <laughs> I deserve, I'm, I, I take the blame for the stupid test. Um, um, but I think if you really go for the 30 circles, um, uh, second time around, as I already said, something interesting happens that you quite often are finished early and then you suddenly have all this time and then and then you can use this time to go back and touch up to some of the circles. And so previously this was this impossible test where it's just like you have no time at all to do what you want to do and suddenly you, you in the, within this impossible test you have all the time. And that's something I want to discuss later. Uh, but yeah, I think like there is this interesting thing where it's like the first time you do this test, it seems impossible. It seems impossible to fill in the 30 circles. And then um, it's actually completely doable. It's fine. It's, there's, no, there's no problem. It's just like something happened here. Uh, actually, at this point, I want you to pause for a second here. I, I want you to pause this video. And uh, for a second, just like give it a couple of thoughts. What actually happened? Why was you, weren't you able to fill in the circles the first time around? And why were you able to fill in the, the second time around? I would actually like, like make, make up your own thoughts, like go in deep inside and think about what, what, what happened there, okay? Pause the video now. All right, good. So there was a goal to fill in the circles. There were some ambiguities about the goal. 
Like I, it seems like I had like this list of rules and it seemed like very concise and clear, but actually there weren't. There were some kind of like some ambiguities that, that I deliberately left in here. This was actually part of a deception. I actually set this test up in a way that had some uh, intentional ambiguities and like uh, manipulated you a little bit. So as a result, you filled in the ambiguities with your own assumptions, right? There were some assumptions that kind of crept in, like there's something unclear, I'm going to just assume blankety blank. And those assumptions that you filled in here, they got in the way, they, they made you do bad decisions, they made it seem like this test is impossible. It's the assumptions that got in the way, it's not the test that was impossible, it was the assumptions that made it impossible. Okay, so let's get a bit specific. What are the assumptions? I want to discuss at least two specific ones that I think are worth discussing. So one assumption that crept in is this assumption of um, that we are valuing hard work, overvaluing hard work over actual results. So I said, you know, in one of the things I said, as much as you can, this kind of like left a door open for you to substitute, you know, <laughs> your own goals to kind of like say like, oh, results below 30 circles are fine. All right? It's okay. as, as much as you can, whatever I'm going to draw, that's going to be my result, you know. Um, I think this allowed for this idea to sneak in of a noble failure, right? That it's fine. Uh, that's something that we got, I think we're brought up with. That's something that definitely are we being taught in school. Um, this idea that you know, if you just show up, if you do it, you know, your hundred percent. If you just work diligently and hard, it doesn't really matter what you end up with. You know, you, it, the important thing is that, that you give it, give, give it your best try. You know, the idea here being is that the activity itself is kind of like the reward, and and like uh, trying, like the the your attitude towards is the is, is the important thing, and not actually what comes out. And I'm not saying that this is wrong. There's definitely situations where this absolutely holds true. Um, but also it's, there are situations where it's wrong or at least there, it's kind of like this convenient excuse to, for us to sometimes to move the goalposts, to not second guess ourselves, right? Because the truth is, and that's kind of like pretty obvious, it, just because you worked hard doesn't mean that the thing that you work on was the right thing to work on. If I go to a restaurant and order pizza and a chef works really hard to bring me a lasagna, that's great, but it's not what I wanted. Like, throw this lasagna into the trash, please. I want my pizza. <laughs> Maybe donate it to charity. <laughs> so in this case, in the 30 circle test, the first time around, maybe you work hard on it and you really try it. Uh, and your work ethic was good. You work hard on filling in 30 circles, but your decision on what to invest your time in was wrong. Like you invest a lot of time doing things that didn't really move you towards your goal, that kind of like um, held you up a little bit. So your initial planning was wrong in a way that actually made you waste your time, made you waste your work. And I would claim that this is actually worse in, in some ways than bad work ethic, right? It's worse than being lazy. You'd rather be a lazy person that gets their priorities straight that, you know, doesn't do much, but what the thing that they do is the thing that actually matters. Uh, you'd rather be that person than some kind of like crazy workaholic that just like does everything and, and works really hard and works themselves to the bone, but none of the things that they work on actually matter. There's this um, saying that I really like, work smart, not hard, right? And I think that, like this attitude there is that you, that prevails that, you know, any problem can be just solved if you work hard on it, you know, like the gun bate, you know, just, just do it, you can, you can do it. Um, I think this attitude oft, quite often can uh, has a dark side, and that, that dark side is kind of like a denial. The denial that you as a person, that you have limits, that there is just so much you can do in a given day, in a given week, in a given month, and so forth, right? That there is, there is just something finite to the amount of stuff you can do. That seems disempowering, but I think it's like a very important thing to realize in order to not to waste your time. And I think this 30 circle test is a really good way to disprove this uh, assumption that, you know, <laughs> that working hard will solve any problem. Because in this 30 circle test, like, what if you work a little bit harder, right? Like, what if you pushed through? Like, what if, didn't, if you didn't change your attitude and did, didn't change your strategy? What if you, on your second time around, you were filling in the circles the same way, but just like trying to do it as fast as you can, right? Um, 
it wouldn't really move the needle. You would maybe get three more, five more circles in, but there's like 30 to go, right? It wouldn't really change much. So the 30 circle test is an example or, or a situation where working harder is not the solution. It's just like, that's what, what I like to say, hard work is not enough. Not in the sense that you need to work even harder, but in the sense of that's just completely not the way to solve this problem. We have to actually think laterally. We have to actually add uh, something else than just hard work to solve this problem. So that was assumption number one that I think crept. And as assumption number two um, that crept in is like this <laughs> unsustainable perfectionism that I like to call, <laughs> which oh man, that's a that's that's a term. So um, what happened here? You see me draw, draw this beautiful elaborate drawing, right? Like the pizza and the tennis ball and the and the Saturn, right? And they were so beautiful, um, uh, elaborate, and you immediately kind of like you assimilated this idea, like, oh, this is what this drawings is supposed to be like. You kind of planted this idea in your head that this is what the drawings are supposed to look like, uh, without even considering that I am operating under very different limitations that you were operating. I wasn't on the clock. I t could take my sweet time and fill in all those useless details. Um, but you were on the clock. You only had, you know, 30 seconds, uh, 6 seconds to fill 30 circles. So you only had 2 second, seconds per drawing. All those drawings that, that I was doing, the beautiful pizza with the, you know, you know, with the salamis and so forth, they were just not happening for you. That's what just like not f for you to do. That was just something that I could do, right? But simply by watching me do it, you kind of assimilated this idea that this is what, what a drawing is supposed to look like. And I kind of like cheated here a bit of you nowhere. Know, I said like, oh, every um, drawing has to be different. And, and also like I said, there's no cheating at the end. Like, you know, I have to stop when, when it's, uh, you went six seconds. It kind of like introduced the idea that there's going to be scrutiny, <laughs> that somebody will pay attention to, <laughs> to what you're drawing, you know? And I think this is just like another facet, another side of this, of this noble failure idea. In this case, the only way to fill in the 30 circles is to like cut corners like crazy. And I think this is something that we are like really paranoid and, and afraid of getting caught on. Like this is not something that we want to be, be in a situation in where you do something really, really quickly and, and then somebody's like, wait a minute, uh, 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 what you're doing there? You know, like this is, we're really self-conscious about this kind of stuff. To the point where we actually often like to choose to go down with the ship, to do the noble failure, you know, to, to be like, oh, I, I haven't finished, but the stuff I have is really good, you know, like, um, it's, that's, that seems more acceptable than to be like, oh, I'm finished. And then somebody's like, oh, wait a minute, what, what did you do there? Like, are, are you handing, are you serious handing this in, you know? So yeah, we'd rather have the noble failure there, right? And so yeah, I gotta be honest, when I did this test uh, on my own for the first time, it hit me really hard because I realized, wow, uh, th this is this like this perfect analogy to how things work when I work on, on my own project, when I work on my own video games. It's like, this is exactly what happens there as well. And it's like this perfect analogy, but instead of, you know, spending a year <laughs> of coming to this conclusion, it's, I actually do it like in this one minute time. I can really observe what is happening and, and question my assumptions here. And I think like a lot of students will <laughs> like often object is like, wait a minute, this is, this test says nothing about me. Like it's just some, it's, it's been rigged. The entire test is like the, the deck was stacked against, stacked against me. Like this is saying nothing about me. This is just like some, some trick that you pulled off here, right? This is an unfair test. But the reality is like, in real life, is even more unfair than this. All these ambiguities that I set up for you, they will be there in real life when you work on your own games as well. And they will be even crazier and harder. And this, the situation will be stacked against you even harder. So nobody will actually tell you how to make your game. Nobody will sit down with you. Ah, wait a minute, you have to focus on this and you have to focus on this. And you have to watch up not to do this, you know, nobody will guide you through a through your video game you have kind of have to f make your own decisions there and these are wide open for all sorts of really bad um, uh, assumptions to creep in and prevent you from finishing your game this is an perfect analogy actually so let's go go back to those two assumptions that i talked about how we overvalue hard work right so what i often see is um 
independent game developers pick this these crazy pie in the sky projects without even considering how those projects will get finished they just like have a great idea and it's just like have this idea that if they work hard on this idea eventually it will be great because we have like this assumption that if you work hard on something it will be automatically good that hard work automatically leads to good places and I think this is also often fueled by the media. So like here's an article that just I just saw this just came out recently. One man's 60 year journey to release an MMO made entirely by themselves, right? Like this is a story about a guy who made an MMO and it took them 16 years. He started when he was 10 year old. And I think this is bad. And I'm not talking about the actual game, like I haven't played the game, so I cannot really tell. To take 16 years to develop a game is not a healthy, sustainable way to make games. This is not how game development should work. If you mm, designed a game and it took 16 years to develop the game, then th there was a des design mistake there. You make a huge mistake. You didn't design with the available resources in mind, right? You didn't consider that you were just one person. You didn't consider how much it took. It was a huge flaw in your design. This is bad. And the only th remarkable thing here is that despite this huge flaw, you actually got finished. That's the only remarkable thing, that, that you did it in spite of the flaw. This story is really only noteworthy because it's such a freak outlier. It's just like this freak accident that just happened, right? It's like somebody uh, climbing Mount Everest barefoot, right? It's like, wow, okay, wow, he did it good for him. Weird, but okay, it's not an aspiring story, right? This is not something that we should encourage people to follow up on, you know, like, oh, you should do this as well. No, this is not what climbing mountains should be like. You shouldn't climb mountains barefoot, I don't think so, at least. You probably shouldn't climb Mount Everest in the first place, but it, I'm just saying, like, this is not something to to look up to, right? And I think I really like the 30 circle test here because it really, um, it, it makes us think about the budget, about the constraints. And that's something that that a lot of independent developers not, are not doing. They're not thinking about budgets, especially if they're working alone. You have this like this idea, you know, you maybe you will live at you with your parents, or maybe you work on your game in your free time. You don't think you, um, of of yourself of have, as having a budget. A budget is something for you know big company that has to pay wages, but you're like this free independent spirit, you know, just pursuing your dreams and doing your thing. And I'm I'm not saying that it's a bad idea. I don't want to take that away from you. That's that's really fine. Um, but I'm, what I'm saying is, just because you're a single person, that actually means that you're even more constrained um, than a big company, to, that you're even more on a budget, that you're even more on this clock than a big company. Because a big company has a lot of employees, and they will be able to fill in those 30 circles a lot more reliably and um, a lot more easily. But if you're just one person, you will be filling in those circles so much slower. So you really have to think about where you're investing your time. And if you're not really done, are not the type who plans ahead, who makes like a schedule and so forth, that's fine. But I think it's still worthwhile every now and then to sit back and think and, you know, zoom out and think about, okay, where am I? How am I doing? How far down the 30 circles am I? Am I even, is the thing I'm even working on right now, is that even actually something that will be, bring me closer to the goal? Is there maybe some kind of assumption that I can challenge? Is there something I can change about the project? Um, that uh, will allow me to finish this, this this quicker, right? The 30 circle test um, helps us to think more about the goal of the work rather than the actual work itself. The actual work itself is not inherently meaningful if there is no result. And this leads me to like the second assumption that we have, like this this uns unsustainable perfectionism. So uh, as I talked about how you know you imitated me drawing the circles, this happens in video game development all the time. Uh, what a good game is, is defined by the games that are out there. You look at the games that are out there and you're like inspired by them and you get hyped and you want to be making games like this. You see some games like, wow, this is something I want to be doing. Um, but what you don't think about is how those games that are already out there, that are quite often done into very, under very different circumstances with very different limitations than the ones that you operate in. So this is a, like a typical post here. Uh, I found it on a roguelike subreddit, right? And I don't want to put this guy on blast. It's, it's fine. It's just like something that's very typical. So this guy is like first year student, first game they're working on, and he wants to make a roguelike, uh, and he's inspired by Enter the Gungeon, but it's supposed to be first person, like 3D, right? And okay, cool, right. Um, so this game works alone. Uh, Enter the Gungeon was made by six people, uh, four full-time ex-EA employees 
and two part-timers and it took them two years. So let's say five people, right? Uh, if he wants to just copy uh, Enter the Gungeon, it would take him 10 years. Probably a little longer because he is he just doesn't have any experience. He is, he is not an XEA employee. And also he wants to make it in 3D. So that's even more than, than that. So it's like what, 15, 20 years? Like this is some crazy project. How are those circles ever gonna get filled for him? If you are going to fail in your circles in 60 seconds, then your circles just can't look like the circles of you know some triple A studios. You have to adjust accordingly. You have to challenge your assumptions. You have to develop your own idea of what the circle is supposed to look like. So yeah, this is what leads me to this name, Lazy Devs, right? There is a thing I like to say. Making games is impossible. Making games is impossible. Like filling in those 30 circles. It's impossible. It's actually impossible. It's impossible unless... Unless you come up with some kind of trick. Unless you come up with some kind of way to skirt around the constraints. Unless you do this kind of like, ah, 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 but you didn't say, Simon says, you know, some kind of technicality that you can leverage to make the impossible something that you can actually maybe achieve. And as I said, this is hard to do. This is very hard to do because we are afraid getting caught cheating like this. We are afraid of the scrutiny. We are afraid that somebody will call us out on this. We are afraid of being called out, being a lazy dev. That's right, that's the term, right? That's the term that often comes up in online discussions. It's like this final nail in the coffin of all those broken projects, all those unfinished projects that, that made us stick to our bad assumptions and made us not fill in the 30 circles because we were afraid of being called out being a lazy dev. Now, let me spell this out. Lazy dev is like peak armchair game development. It's a completely made up term. It's toxic and stupid. It's invoked by people who have just no clue of how game development works. It's literally like, you know, there is an issue. I don't know how game development works. I guess the developers just didn't do it. Just didn't do it because they're lazy. It's this complete bankruptcy in imagination and empathy. It's like this complete intellectual surrender. Playground logic. Even though the term is just completely uh, empty, it does feed into real fears and, and does some real harm. So that's why I was thinking, you know, why not turn this poison into some kind of medicine, right? Why not just reclaim this, uh, um, this term? Why not turn it into a banner to rally behind? Why not embrace this so it's something that can't hurt us anymore because we have accepted this, right? And so that's why I call this channel Lazy Devs. I think a lazy dev is actually something worth aspiring to. And I think the 30 circle test shows it. A lazy dev will fill out those 30 circles. A lazy dev will find a way. That's the kind of mindset that it takes to fill in the 30 circles. And that's the kind of mindset that it takes to finish a game. That's the kind of mindset to not just to do something easy, but the kind of mindset that it takes to turn something that's impossible into something that's barely doable. So yeah, there you have it. That's why I like to do the 30 circles test um, with my students. Um, I like to do it to show them that, that, as I said, you know, making games requires more than hard work. And I don't, don't mean like harder work even, but um, something beyond hard, hard work. Something that requires kind of like a radical mindset, of putting everything on the line, um, especially your own assumptions in favor of, you know, uh, of the game. And assumptions are really hard to put on the line. Like assumptions are really hard to see in the first place. And even if you see, they're difficult to examine because we hold on to them. We, that's, that's what we build ourselves on, right? And then challenging those assumptions is even harder, right? Um, because we are afraid of finding out that something that we hold, uh, you know, true and dear to our heart is actually some kind of like self-delusion, right? This is, this is something that's really hard to do. And it's so much easier to just pull in another all-nighter into the project, right? That's just so much easier just to stick in with the plan and continue on, right? So now to finish this up, I just like three leftovers that quite kind of didn't really fit in that I want to discuss.
First, um, remember how I said um, that game development was a lot more unfair than the 30 circles test, that real life was a lot more hard than the 30 circles test. And in one way in which game development is kind of harder than the 30 circle test is in game development, you actually don't know how many circles there are until you get very close to the end. So imagine doing this test again for the first time, but imagine not knowing how many circles there are, right? How would that feel? Imagine this, like you would like fill in maybe six circles and the time is over. And then like, my gosh, I didn't do, the, I didn't fill it, I didn't complete the test. How many circles are there? Maybe there are eight, you know, maybe there are 10. What if there's 10? And then you do this test again and you hit 10 and it's like, what? What if there's 15? You know? <laughs> and you're not even close. How many, how many times you would have to repeat this test uh, until you hit the 30, right? And this is why I like to say you learn making games by finishing games. Um, you really need to go through this test one time all the way through to appreciate how hard it is, to really see how many circles there are. And not getting all the way to the end of the test is not teaching you as, as much as you think. Like you think get, you learned a lot by getting to the halfway point, but you actually didn't because it wasn't actually the halfway point. You just thought it was the halfway point, but it, the, the goal is so much further away, right? Yeah, so that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, and that's something that uh, a lot of uh, art, like art focused students um, often talk to me. Um, they, they, this test often discourages them because, um, you know, I force them to do ugly circles. They like, you know, they art oriented. They like to do pretty things. And then I say like, no, doing pretty things is bad. You have to do those ugly things. You have to fill in the circles in an ugly way. Uh, that's how you get finished. And they're like, okay, well, that set up sets them up into this um, very uncomfortable situation where uh, what I'm saying to them is basically they're not allowed to do the pretty things that they're signed up for. And they just sign up for, to make pretty things. And I'm saying like, this is not possible. There's something to it, like their, their concerns are valid, right? Um, when working on when production constraints, you know, you often have to do like these hard payoffs and they always hurt. Uh, you're not, you don't never have as much time as you hoped you would, as a, as a, especially as an artist, right? You have to compromise a lot and that hurts. But I think also there's a silver lining and that's why I like to go through this test a second time around. Because of the thing I mentioned that, that happens where, you know, sometimes you finish early and then within this impossible time constraint, within this thing that was previously unthinkable, you know, like this isn't just impossible to finish. Suddenly you have carved in this little island of calmness, like this little couple of seconds where you are free to really choose on what circles you, you, can, you want to focus on. And you don't have the time to make every circle beautiful and nice and beautiful. But if you play your cards just right, you can make one or two really beautiful. You can you can make make one or two really nice and, and pretty. And I think this is this beautiful analogy to picking your battles, to making you know, having one thing and making it count, and that I think maps very well to game design as well. And and finally, um, this has been a bit of very theoretical episode, so I want to end on a practical note, on some kind of practical, actionable thing that you can take away from this test. What, what's, what's something that you can do? First of all, good news. If you're working with Pico 8, good news. Like, the reason why I really like Pico 8 is that it already makes you think about budgets. Uh, budgets are built into Pico 8. It encourages healthy assumptions, healthy strategies to solve these problems. So this is really good. If you're working Pico 8, this is really good. Moving on, I think this assumption that there is some kind of trick at the core of every game that made it possible, like there's some kind of like cheat at every game. I think that's really powerful. And I think a really good exercise is to uh, start looking at games this way, like start looking at, especially like small independent games, start looking at them and asking yourself, okay, what did this person do? Like, what is the trick that they used to make this game possible? Okay, so like a couple of uh, examples here. Uh, Thomas was alone. What if all my characters are just squares? I don't have to do any sprites. Or Minute, right? Minute, I really love Minute. What if it's Zelda, but it's actually super short? And actually, it's so short, it's actually challenging. It's the whole point of the game. And also, what if it's also all black and white? 
FTL. What if you explore space, but you never actually leave space? If you all just stay on the sh spaceship all the time, and if something happens on the planet, it's just a text box. Super hot. Uh, what if it's a first person shooter, but we actually don't have any textures? And instead of having like levels, it's just like sh very short, disconnected scenes. So our levels can be really, really small. 30 flights of loving. Um, all of the above. <laughs> You get the idea, right? I think this this is a really good exercise, and I think this sets you up for this kind of frame of mind, this kind of switch where eventually these cheats, these tricks will become part of the actual game idea when you formulate them. So you no longer go like, I want to make a game like Enter the Gungeon, um, but instead you say like, I want to make a game like Enter the Gungeon, but blankety blank. And then the blankety blank is, you know, like some kind of trick, some kind of hack that allows you to finish the game not in 10 years, but in like two months, right? And yeah, I think this is a good point to end this video on. Uh, so actually, this is a good question to throw back to you. What are some cool, radical, time-saving hacks uh, that you found in some independent games? Something that you like, oh, wow, that's a good idea, you know, that saves a lot of time, you know. What are some kind of the cool tricks that you found yourself? Write them in the comment section and write also how many circles you were able to fill in, in the first time. I want to I wanna see how, how well you did. Uh, right, so this is it for today. This is the video for this month. I'm working on something special for next month. It's gonna be really exciting. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.